Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. In a world where rugged and reliable matters, Ruger stands strong. Celebrating 75 years of American-made craftsmanship, Ruger continues to set the standard for excellence in firearms. From the iconic 1022 to the American rifle and beyond, each firearm embodies precision engineering and our deep-rooted traditions. Join us in honoring a legacy built on strength, innovation, and the American spirit. Yeah. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. We're at the SCI National Convention in Nashville, Tennessee at the Women Go Hunt booth. And I'm with Mary O'Neill Phillips from Country Outdoors. And it's so lovely to have you yeah, here. Thank you. Um, all the way across the pond from Australia. Yes, yeah. So, yeah, I'm from Australia originally. I've now lived in Nashville for nine years, mm-hmm. uh, originally from easiest to say Sydney because it's about two hours out of Sydney and then the beach but closest is Sydney but yeah I've been in Nashville now for about nine years and it's good that you're here and you're here with us as this women go hunt booth and the whole purpose of women go hunt with SCI is that we encourage women to go hunting and you you have really kind of a funny story you come from like a non-hunting background yeah tell everybody the story you just told me offline about your boyfriend which ex-boyfriend yeah ex (laughs) which really made me kind of chuckle to myself. Um, Yeah, so I grew up, my family had a small cattle farm in Australia, and so I grew up with, like, the rural culture. I was riding a motorbike, a Peewee 50, before I was riding a normal bicycle and was always very outdoor-driven, but hunting culture in Australia is just not as embedded into the culture as as it is here. And I wanted to learn how to hunt. I actually had, like, a really basic um uh compound bow on the farm but i look at it now and i'm like it looks like something that you buy at a kid's toy shop no over here. But that's what i got my hands on anyway my ex-boyfriend in australia um he was in the special forces and he used to hunt a lot mainly foxes and pigs and kangaroos and stuff and i asked him to take me hunting and he said it wasn't a place for women and that no bloke would ever take me hunting and so um I ended up moving over here for my acting career and hosting career and when I was over here I met my now husband, um, Zach, who he produced for Sub 7, Mm -hmm. which did The Crush and all those shows and he said, do you want to go on a turkey hunt? And I was like, absolutely. And that was the first time that I'd ever been invited on a hunt, let alone by a man. And so he took me on my first hunt up in Nebraska and him and his buddy called in two gobblers 500 yards over the sand hills. And I shot this bird literally like five yards from my face. Mm -hmm. It was the most adrenaline pumping experience. We then went back and cleaned the game. I kept the feathers in my hat, the whole thing. And it was a very good introduction into a, the, the sport of hunting, but also the whole process of wild game and all of that. And them as well, just teaching me how to do it so that I could do it on my own. Yeah. They were they were great guys to get me into it. Yeah. And so. they weren't disparaging. And no. I, I mean, I can't, I mean, obviously different countries have different cultures. Yeah. And coming from a place, I mean, I grew up, my dad let me do whatever I wanted. Heck, I was practically a boy yeah. the first part of my childhood. I mean, because I just did everything outside and I was always had my hands in the mud and my dad took me hunting and he never had a son. So he really embraced the fact that I was interested in that. And ha- I mean, this is what and why partly that the Women Go Hunt movement is so impactful and powerful because mm-hmm. we can do all of these things. We can look beautiful. We can be women yep. and still go hunt. And I think 
uh, women encouraging each other is so important because yeah. we do have a tendency to be competitive with each other. Yeah. And, you know, social media is the stealer of joy. I truly 100%. think like comparison of each yes. other's lives. And we, you know, we all know that's not the real version of what's going on in our lives. It's like death by a thousand cuts to your own soul. Totally. And even though you know that, you still look and you like sub subconsciously are comparing yourself, even though you've got... A, a husband and a kid, whatever you've got going on yeah. I, that's social media is like there's pros and cons to it but I think that having conversations like this is so important because we should be encouraging each other yeah. and getting behind each other and you know the women are like the the fastest growing demographic getting into hunting and if those guys hadn't have helped me get into it then I couldn't I, you know I, I had a girlfriend of mine I had a baby seven months ago and had a pretty crazy birth story and um, a girl that I became friends with in the last year, she, her and I met and we had some conversations and it wasn't hunting, it was an outdoor survivalist course that I was doing and it was something that I really wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, Is that the warrior women? No, so I did it with, um, uh, oh gosh, what's it called? I'm gonna to have to get the I'm gonna to have to get the name of it. I did it with a group here in Tennessee, okay. um, and just from like my elk hunts and all of that, and being off the grid, I was like I had really wanted to truly learn some uh, wilderness emergency survival skills. Yeah. And so this was something that after having a baby, I was like I just want to do something for myself to make myself feel empowered. And I had this girlfriend of mine, and she hunts a little bit, but she hadn't really same thing had opportunity yeah. to get, do stuff like that. So I brought her along with me for this wilderness survival course and her and I learned how to make fire from scratch, build shelter, uh, source water and all of this. And she said at the end of that, she was like, thank you so much for bringing me to do this because I, it's made me feel so empowered, so mm -hmm. encouraged, not just to now be a mother, but as a woman. And it's so important for us to give each other, you know, that yeah. enthusiasm and backing. Yeah, it is. There, there's nothing like a good tribe. Yeah. Um, and you know, what I've found is when we uplift and encourage each other, we find inspiration in our own life and our own journey. And sometimes we see things in ourselves or realize things about ourselves that are so important for our own personal growth yeah. just by helping someone else yep. and lifting someone else. We all rise. Yeah. I, uh, when I was in acting school, I was given advice from one of my coaches and it's something that I've always held on to. And so anytime you come into a state where you might be comparing or getting jealous, it's really good to remind yourself of. There is no other Christy, there is no other Mary. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, there's a million women out there trying to be the next Angelina Jolie, yes. the next Scarlett Johansson. There's no other Mary O'Neill. Figure out what you're good at, what you have to contribute to the world. And do it. And do it, but do it really well. And don't let people down yeah. and be a good person. And, you know, and so that's something that I've always tried to take on and then pass that on too. Because when you remember that, you're like, mm. God has made me completely individually. My journey mm. is separate from everybody yeah. else's. And I need to figure out what are the gifts that he's blessed me with Amen. and how I can contribute that to the world. And once you do that, oh gosh, the weight that it comes off, off your shoulders and you're like, good for her. You go girlfriend. That is great that you're doing that. I'm doing my thing. How can we help each other? That's right. Yeah. And yeah. I actually, it's, it's kind of funny that you say that. A lot of people call this imposter syndrome where you feel like you need to be someone else or something or all things. And I am completely guilty of it. I, I mean, I, I shoot for Ruger and I often feel like like I need to be really good at all of these things because they make firearms for so many disciplines. And you know, do I need to be a competitive long range shooter? Do I need to be a firearms instructor? Do I need to be a three gun uh, competitor? Do I need to be a hunter? Do I? And I'm finding myself like, oh, should I be doing all of these things? And and I do a little bit of all of those things. I, I do some long range, you know, competition, but I'm not training five hours a day to be competitive, do I? So I, I dabble in all of these things because it's fun yeah. and I love the community. But I had tried to take a pause this year where, where Ruger looked at me this year and they were like, hey, Christy, we love you. We have all of these team members we want you to focus on being you. Be out west. Go hunting. Exactly. Raise your mules. Go take your pack string into the back country. You don't have to be perfect at everything. And I think yep. as a woman and 
you know, being, um, you know, very type A in personality, oftentimes we feel like we have to be the best at absolutely everything. And we're striving for this form of perfection mm -hmm. in all facets of everywhere. And then you kind of run very thin and you might not be doing what you should be doing very well. And that was great for me. Like I literally, like, like you were talking about, I had this weight lift off of me as like, okay, oh, I don't have to be perfect. I just have to be me. Yeah. And I, and I know that feeling. I don't know exactly what you walked through, but I had something similar happen to me. So after I, I moved over here from Australia, I have been very, very much like, this is my only plan in life to be an entertainer. I have no option, no plan B. I hustled my kahunas off to get here. Yeah. Moved over with no money. My Anyway, when I got pregnant and I had the baby, I like had this, I only realized it a couple months after I had Molly, but I was back working at six weeks after having her because I was just like, I've got to get back out there and I need to do this and I need to do that. And if I don't, then no one's going to like in my brain, it's, well, it wasn't logical, but I was like, I need to get back out there. Like I, I have always been running at this pace. And if I don't, then this, that, da, 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 da. And I only realized a couple months after having her that I was like I, that like yeah. I had run myself so ragged and I, and the expectations that I was putting on myself were unrealistic unre and unfair and also <clears throat> that's and my course had diverted and so it's a new path that I'm going and I'm not in that single running and able to do and it's like but your I'm able, season changed in your life. Yeah, but I but I get that when you're trying to wear a million hats mm. and you're like but it's good when you can check in and you're like okay that's all right like this is where I'm going now mm -hmm. and it's fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. Talk about your journey here and in, in being an actress. And also, I really laughed earlier when you had said, again, offline, um, I realized I, <laughs> I need to stay in my lane on things. And you were know, talking about singing and performing and, well, and all of these things that you're doing. Elaborate on that a little bit because I think it kind of lends itself to the same conversation yeah. where we're trying to be great at absolutely everything. Yep, yeah. So when I moved to <clears throat> long, okay, backstory, I uh, was acting in Australia it was a long story for me to get there. I actually worked in like PR, and, sorry, uh, communications and in law and all of that in my early 20s and I hated it. I never wanted to do it, but my parents are both academics and they um, were also baby boomers and never changed jobs and all that stuff. And so they wanted me to get my degree and do all of that. And so I found myself at 21 making, you know, close to $80,000 working corporate in Australia and I hated my life. Mm -hmm. I And then I went on a backpacking trip around Mexico for Mexico, Costa Rica, blah, 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 for like six months and like was living the most wild life ever and got to see Puerto Escondido, like the Quicksilver Pro, the biggest waves in the world, all this stuff. And I got back and got the train in to work that day. And I looked around at everybody and everyone looked like they were wanting to suicide themselves like it was just like depressive you could just see binge drinking all weekend binge like everyone it was just lights out yeah and I just looked and was like I'm this is not going to be my life like I am not doing this and yeah. so I went in that day to work and quit and enrolled myself in a conservatory of acting in Australia at the New York Film Academy and I was like okay if I'm going to do this entertaining acting thing I'm going to do it well and actually study the craft and not just be you know no offense to TikTokers today, but like try and put some some craft Substance. behind it and yeah, respect what I'm doing and going into. So I did that. I did a couple shows in Australia, including The Bachelor, where I was brought on as the first intruder in the world to stir it up, which is a whole other thing, whole other conversation for another day. Um, very, very juicy, but uh then I moved to LA and I was in LA for three months and essentially God told me, uh, it was like one of the first times I'd had a true Holy Spirit interaction mm -hmm. um, uh, that I was going to, this place was going to change me for the worst if I stayed. Um, and I could feel it in my spirit, like something was shifting where I was very unsettled mm. and I felt like if there would be a lot of my, uh, a lot that I would have to give up of myself to have success in this town. And I think I could have done it, but it would have been signing a deal with the devil in the spiritual world, essentially. Um, 
And for you to have the discernment to listen and hear that and not put your wishes above God's wishes and wants for you is so profound because so, I mean, at some point in our life, you know, we've heard the Holy Spirit and some people choose to ignore it. Yeah. And then you take this course and this path in life that ends up hard or difficult or takes you, you know, way off course. And for you to hear that and have the discernment to take that lead, even though it was kind of against your own wishes of your own flesh and blood, like you were like, I want to be doing this. And instead you take this new course on faith. Yeah. That's very profound. Well, I had, I had ignored the Holy Spirit and I would ignored God a lot before that and I had started kind of a routine before I moved to the States every morning I would wake up at sunrise and go down to the cliffs by the ocean where my parents house is we've got a farm and then we have a house by the cliffs and I'd wake up and watch the sunrise every day Mm -hmm. and talk to God and that um, meditation with him every morning really changed my life before I moved to the States. And so I was in a, in a completely different relationship where I think I was able to hear it yeah. years before that. every Everything would go wrong because I wasn't hearing him and he'd be talking to me. And I remember the first morning I went and started that ritual on the cliffs, the sun started rising and I sat there and just like the, the heat from the sun and just the power of the ocean and the waves I started weeping on the cliffs like a little girl because I really saw God for the first time. And I remember saying, I can't believe you've been here every day and, I've, and, and I have ignored you. I'm going to cry now because like, that was the, literally yeah. the beginning of it all for me. But um, that changed my life. And so, yes, by the time I got to L.A., I was able to... I was still trying to make this thing happen for myself and my ego was still running. But after enough things had gone wrong where I could see this is not where I'm meant to be, mm-hmm. I heard him. Um, and so the, I had about $600. I was working in a hostel cleaning toilets. And the longer story of that is, which I might as well just tell because we're here, but um, a lot of things had been going wrong. And I was walking down Sunset Boulevard with another actor friend of mine. And there was a junkie walking down the road and he was screaming for help. And um, he was bleeding out the back of his head. Oh, my gosh. And no one would stop and give him help. And I said to the guy that I was with, we need to help him. And he said, it's it's not your problem. And I just, like, felt inside my spirit to say to him, it's never it's never somebody's problem, is it? He's still, he still belongs to the same God and he's lost. And so... It took me about 40 minutes to get him help and um, eventually the police and everything came and they got my story and then started patching him up on the side of the road and sent him on the way and I was reflecting on it and I was like, why didn't they take him to the hospital? Because he'd been shot in the back of his head and um, that was when the Holy Spirit said to me, this is not the place for you and you need to leave or it will change you. And so I had like $500 left in my bank account and I had the decision to either go back to Australia with my tail tucked between my legs or something was just saying, go back to Nashville, go back to Nashville. And I'd been here for CMA Festival before and I loved country music. And um, so I changed my ticket to come down here. And the day that I landed down here, it was June. It was like a hundred degree heat wave. I had no car, barely any money. And I'm walking around not knowing where I was. And I went into a cafe and I asked this girl for directions. And she gave me the directions and then she said, hold on a second. And she turned and she got a jam, a jar full of water and gave it to me and said, take it for your walk. It's really hot outside. And it was like this penny drop moment for me where I was like, oh, that was a really kind gesture. And I did not feel that in Los Angeles no. and there's something here. And, and Tennessee is so green and mm. beautiful and I'm so drawn towards... Um, nature anyway and so that was where it started and so I went back to Australia and I spoke to some of my friends and I said look if it's going to take me acting in our latest to give up who I am I'm not going to do it but I'm a really good entertainer and um, as far as I can see there's no females hosting in country music in the states and so my girlfriend was like so what are you going to do you're going to start interviewing people here and I said no I'm going straight back to Nashville 
And so I'd save up money, like 10 grand at a time, fly over here and do sit down interviews with as many songwriters and artists that would interview with me. I'd have them filmed very high quality. I created a website and I'd have everything professionally edited and put onto a website. And I did this for three years back and forth, broke. Like I would, I remember for two weeks, I literally bought a bag of jerky and a loaf of bread and I ate that and I would walk everywhere. Like I had no money, I was broke. Um, and my family in Australia were just like, you're insane. Why are you doing this? This is never going to work. Like the, you, sometimes your family can be your worst critics too. Mm -hmm. No one believed in what I was but doing. But you were walking with the Lord. I just knew, like I knew in my spirit. And the other thing is like down here in the South, you were, there is a freedom in expressing your faith that I had never experienced before mm -hmm. either. And so just being able to explore that too. And I just knew there was, there was a reason why I was meant to be here. And then eventually um, the country music channel in Australia picked up my interviews and asked me to be the red carpet host for the international award show. And so at that show, I did all the live on the red carpet, Jason Aldean, Kelsey Ballerini. And it just like, that was my first big chance. Mm -hmm. And then it just snowballed from there. And I met Zach. Zach got me into hunting. And that was just literally an addiction from the moment. Like just, I, f I felt like there was this <laughs> whole part of my life that I had been missing out on. And I truly was like, now I get it. Like mm -hmm. I, now I totally get it. And I, I've wondered before, like, what is it like for somebody who grows up in it? Mm -hmm. Cause I, I only know, mm -hmm what I have had experienced and I remember the first time sitting in a tree stand and I and watching like a spider weaving a web in front of my face just thinking how have I been asleep while this has been going yes. on and now it's like I get to be like this is so cool I'm a part of this secret that like most of the world has no idea is going on mm -hmm. yeah it's it is it is a secret it's it's the some people call it i mean i think of it as the fountain of youth even yeah i mean you see the the will of of these hunters that are on these mountains that are breathing fresh air and they're they're in a a better place where they're disconnected from the hustle and bustle and just the the stuff that we get lost in 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 the world in the city in in town and it's just reconnect with our souls our spirits with our friends, with our family. Yeah. And there's really nothing better than that. I mean, no. you find people overcoming any kind of preconceived disabilities and and literally conquering, conquering mountains. I mean, I've seen men and women that are amputees conquer mountains and, and you know, take whatever preconceived limitations they thought on their, they've had on their bodies or their minds and said, no, I won't accept that as my fate. Yeah. And I'm going to live differently. And, yeah. and they do that out there. Yeah. It's the most healing place I think you can find for mon mind body and soul so for you, but I and I t and I 100% agree with you I am super curious to know though like for you mm -hmm. as a kid getting into it like mm -hmm. what's the I, I've I don't know why I have never asked my husband that question but it's something <laughs> that I've thought about a lot yeah like I'd love to hear from your perspective what that was like getting into it from a child as a child well I don't know any difference so yeah. growing up I mean my family, we've never been to Disneyland. Yeah. We, my parents were never vacation families. Like when we went on vacation, we packed our mules into the back country and I caught frogs and went fishing with yeah. my dad. I mean, I don't know any different. And so I actually have kind of a interesting, when I come to events like this in Nashville and you know, everybody wants to go downtown on Broadway and it's super fun, I am extremely overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, it is really difficult for me to process all of the sound, all of the people, it's all of the... a sensory overload. Yeah, I totally. have a very hard time with it. Yeah. And as outgoing as I am, I'm actually not. No, I'm the same. I'm an um, introvert, extrovert. Yeah. No, no, I, t I, I completely understand mm -hmm. that. Um, my husband does the grocery <laughs> shopping for us. Like I come in these events and I'm so, you know, you're so, you have so much energy and you're putting all of this out there. And when I get home, I'm all about, okay, I want to get quiet. I want to be you with my to animals that. and have my yeah. safe space. And my husband, <laughs> bless his heart, he's way more outgoing than I am. He grew up in a city. So he, he thrives on that and he'll do all of our grocery shopping. And, you know, he kind of nurtures me re 
like, you know, getting back to where I need to be into a different quieter spot. But I live very quietly, you know, yeah. um, I live very peacefully in the woods. There's a lot of people that, that think about, oh my gosh, you live where there's black bears and there's grizzly bears and there's mountain lions. I had a mountain lion stalk me this year. <laughs> and um, people are terrified by that. I'm more afraid walking on the streets of a city than Amen, I am in sister. the woods. Amen. So the yeah. things that you fear, the things that you find comfort in, they, they change, you know, for me, yeah. you know, going to the mall and shopping, I don't own anything designer. No, I you know, I don't, that's just, you know, for me, that's not how I spend my time. Yeah. I spend my time, you know, I want to go brush my mules and yeah. Yeah. give a little love on them. So it's just different, you know, how you are raised, it just changes, you know, how you cope with situations as well. Yeah. No, I get In the heart of the wilderness, every step counts. No matter where or what you're hunting, Onyx Hunt Elite has you covered in the US and Canada with offline capability, land ownership, 3D mapping, and you can even access specialty courses, hunt research tools, and elite specific features. No matter where you pursue the wild, Adventure is assured when you upgrade to Elite for the ultimate hunting experience. There are a lot of Americans that understand the value of hunting, but we all know that right now, national support of hunting is extremely volatile. It seems that with every passing day, our voice is diminished and the court of public opinion is not effectively hearing our side. We need advocates working on our behalf in Washington, D.C. to defend our freedom to hunt. And thankfully, when we need it the most, we have that advocate in Safari Club International. SCI's world headquarters are located in Washington, D.C., just blocks from the United States Capitol, which means that SCI is on the ground with our congressional leaders and federal agencies on our behalf, on behalf of the hunting community. SCI has an active political presence in all 50 states through their extensive chapter network and government affairs staff. If you have ever wondered why you should be a member of SCI, you shouldn't wonder anymore. Join us in the fight to defend hunting. Go to safariclub.org to learn more. Australia is such an interesting place because people are like, oh, what's it like? And it's, I guess, like how the States probably was 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. It's so different. Like where my farm is, we're only two and a half hours out of Sydney, but it's still all dirt roads. That's there's where, where we still live. Just is all the landline. Like, there's no cell service. We have cell service. Yeah, mm. we don't have cell service. Um, it's literally off a dirt road, off a dirt road, off a dirt road. And that has been my haven my whole life is, mm -hmm. you know, being down there. Anytime we'd be getting up to any mischief, mum would be like, we're just staying down at the farm. Like, that's it. And so being able to I, I get that like not having any connection to anything else we moved out of nashville last year when we found out i was having molly we were like no nah, we gotta go yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. talk about that um did country outdoors so you're you're hosting red carpets events for the acms you're you're doing all of that yeah and then country outdoors how long has that been happening so country outdoors started in 2018 and um Mitch Petrie at Outdoor Channel. So mm -hmm. him and I started that together. Mm -hmm. um, and we saw, we just, A, wanted, love the idea of putting country music and the outdoors together. It's not an original idea, but nobody was doing it as a brand. And at the time, country music in Nashville was being very liberally run. And I'm in a safe space to say that, I think. Um, uh, and still is and still is it still is but like at the time in particular the artists that were being told to not talk about faith hunting anything like firearms that. firearms anything conservative or anything like that and so you know because uh, I think one of the good things about me growing up in Australia is I've never been afraid to do anything over here um, and and so I was like well let's just do it mm -hmm. and so we created kind of a safe space for these artists to be able to really talk about the things they wanted to talk about and so on our first season we had everybody from brett akins dylan scott uh parker mccollum like all the all the big artists on there and it just kind of snowballed from there 
And then in 2020, so my husband uh, started with Sub 7 and then he mm -hmm. was at the time filming for um, uh, JP and Johnny Morris. And um, he actually quit that because we pitched to the Outdoor Channel to do the first digital original uh, tra uh, digital series for the network for digital sorry and um turkey tour and weekly episodes aired weekly mm -hmm. and it was the first that they'd ever done and so zach quit working for them with all the benefits and everything and uh we got down to florida and had a u-haul and we we're about to pick up a camper and start our turkey tour and then go to the grocery store and there's a line around the block and everybody's got toilet paper in their carts and covid was here and so we literally had given up everything to put into this show and we get down there and none of the sponsors had actually committed to their, like had paid their checks yeah. and everything yet. And it was the scariest thing for us, but we were like, we're going to make this work. We're going to figure out how to make this work. And so we were able to still get our camper deal. We had to put the insurance on us because they wouldn't cover it themselves. Yeah. And thank the Lord that we got that camper because that saved our i mean our brand grew from it if we were not able to travel in a camper we would have been stuck somebody somewhere and it would have been all over red rover but because we got that camper we hunted did two episodes down in florida and georgia then we saw the states were shutting down we were like let's get straight out west and so by the time we got to kansas all the states were shut down and we just went from from kansas to south dakota we boondocked near the badlands we just ate wild game the entire time for like three months straight literally ate wild turkey i did one shop for some tin food and um we were airing these episodes weekly and so the it just blew up people mm -hmm. were like yes this is awesome i had so many women messaging me saying how do i get into hunting i had women in new york living in apartments messaging me saying how do I start a green space? How do I get into hunting? It was the coolest thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so then from that, uh, it turned into a year round adventure series with fishing and then fall. And so now we're going into our fourth, fifth, fifth mm -hmm. year of it, fourth year of it. Um, and it's just been a blessing. And so we did that. Then we started up my monthly concert series in Nashville. And so again, I started that during the pandemic and just saw opportunity and i really do think it was all very divinely led mm -hmm. um when i moved to nashville i wanted to host a writer's round but you have to be here for a while to yes. earn your teeth in this town and so by the time the pandemic had hit i was like nobody's touring everything shut down opry was shut down ryman was shut down and there was like one or two little songwriter uh venues that were open and i was like I'm gonna do it now. Yeah. And so I actually went to one of the taxidermists in town and said, can you sponsor it with your taxidermy? Mm -hmm. We're gonna cover the stage in taxidermy like you've walked into a Bass Pro. We're gonna get all like rocking chairs, like lodge vibe, and we're gonna put on this show. And so for the first show I had Jordan Davis and Drake White and I sold every show out throughout the pandemic and it was the coolest thing ever and so um that's i mean truly divinely led because i would not have been able to give that a go yeah. otherwise and so country outdoors really grew during a time where it there was not that much opportunity and i know how hard it was on everybody and it was hard on me i my dad died just before the pandemic and the borders shut and i wasn't able to go home oh. until two years after and so yeah. There were a lot of challenges in that, but I think my dad was leading me. I think God was leading us. And um, really the mission now for the brand in general is like the bigger purpose of what we're doing, because I think he will always look after you if you are doing it for his glory. Mm -hmm. And that has been, you know, putting the ego aside, which is still very hard when you're working in entertainment. You have to check yourself constantly. But having those conversations with us internally, like, does this fill our cup up is this for the bigger picture why are we doing this mm -hmm. and so with doing that and checking in constantly we've been growing at a really nice pace so mm -hmm. yeah so talk about miss molly and how that season is transforming <laughs> you and country outdoors yeah. and, i mean she's such a bright spot on your social media Thanks. absolutely beautiful little girl thank you um Firstly, I'm trying to be, navigating social media with her has been a scary thing, but just because 
I, so I work with a non-profit here in Nashville called Nashville Anti-Human Trafficking Coalition and I've learned a lot about human trafficking um, and the pandemic of it here in the States and social media and all of that stuff and so having her on there has been something that I've been learning how to navigate because I just want to protect her yes. as much as I possibly can um, but for anyone watching if you've got kids one of the big things that I've learned is to a don't post photos that could be taken in you know no bath photos or bikinis yes. kids ones of them in their swimwear don't post photos where they're by themselves if they are with one of you it's a lot harder for them to rip for predators to rip a photo um and a big thing is they're not going to go after families where they are fearful of the parents so i think they're pretty we're pretty good on those um mm -hmm. but there's just a couple things because i know you get so you see this cute photo, photo of your kid and you want to post it because you yeah. want everybody to see it but the world is not how yeah. you think it is and you've i've seen so many stories of private accounts where somebody in that even in your own personal network that you don't know about has taken a photo of your kid and it's ended up somewhere horrific so not to scare everybody but like just yeah. to be aware Mindful. so yeah so being a mom is the best thing that's ever happened to me i love her she has given me so much joy and purpose um and this is coming from somebody who was very single and very much driven in my own personal pursuits um it's the best and honestly like it's the coolest thing when you've got your dog and your kid and your husband and, and, and my husband too <laughs> and but, your husband <laughs> but my husband the difference is with yeah. a baby and a dog they just love you like they just like look you know my i can really get under my husband's skin and him need time away from me but the kid my, baby, my husband says to me sometimes <laughs> i love you every day but i don't always like you yeah exactly <laughs> yes. exactly but like you know, she's seven months old and my dog Forrest Gump is a golden retriever and like the two of them, it's just like... They're your heart and soul. And like, I could be having the worst day at work and I could have made a mistake or somebody's, you know, I'm I'm angry at somebody and then I look at them and I'm just like, Aww. this is what matters in life, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like your family and your roots and all of that. But also like the coolest thing that I've been noticing is... I'm feeling more excited about life mm -hmm. because I get to see it through her eyes yeah. and I get to do some things that I did maybe as mistakes do differently and teach her things. Uh, seeing her walking around the show and having like all, all the bear mounts and everything, she thinks it's so cool and she's touching them all. I'm like, please don't rip on the brown bear mount. <laughs> yeah, like you can look, but don't, don't. that's a big deal. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's awesome. Just, you know, and getting to bring her up in it when yeah. I wasn't either. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah. And you had mentioned, you know, she was six weeks old and you were back to the grind. What yeah. did that look like and feel like? So I had her in Australia. I had a very smooth pregnancy and then I had the most traumatic birth. Um, I was induced at 42 weeks and six days. And I feel like that's overdue. Very overdue. I was going to say, I'm not a mother, but I feel like 39 is the magic yeah. number. Yeah, I was very overdue. I was so, if you go onto my social media and have a look, I was so big, so uncomfortable. I, I went through the whole induction. They put me on the Pitocin. The Pitocin, I thought I might die. I have a very high pain threshold. I've fallen off mountains. I've broken bones. I thought I was going to die from this pain. It was the closest I've ever felt to death. Um, then they gave me the epidural and they were like, yeah, you're probably going to have the baby in about an hour. So I said to my husband, go get some lunch, come back, and then it's all on. And then he left the room and all hell broke loose. Started vomiting all over myself. Um, essentially, the epidural had numbed me too much and it was not, I was numb up to my collarbone and if it was rising. And so they took it out because I could have choked and died. And, and then in between that, her heart rate starts going from 80 to 150. Oh my gosh. So then Zach walks in and there's like eight doctors around me and they're like, we're rushing her in for surgery. And Zach's got, yeah. And so it was, it was pretty like crazy. And so I think that when I had her, I ended up checking myself out of the hospital. And I think I was in like survival mode. Like I was trying to just like, make myself busy and not deal with the trauma of what had happened in mm -hmm. that because you go from like being in this cozy birth center and then all of a sudden it's like you feel like you're dying your baby's dying and then it's like you're being sliced open and 
I think I made myself really busy to not deal with mm -hmm. what had happened. And I have a tendency of doing that a lot of the time. I did that with my dad's death too. I kind of like make yourself and then like reflect on it. And I'm like, oh, I'm holding on to a lot of trauma right yeah. now that I need to deal with. Um, and so that's what I did. And I was like out walking 5K like within a week and all of this. And I was just trying to make myself. And you just had a cesarean. Cesarean. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> and I know. I know. And my husband really should have said stay in bed, but he probably wouldn't have been able to anyway. He's <laughs> afraid of you. He's yeah. like, yo, this woman will knock me down to get out the door. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. You probably would have told him. Yeah. I mean, and you know, you have to walk your own walk and spouses... I mean, you know, I they can only tell us so much and we have part to be willing of it was to hear. Honestly, healing for me, walking and being mobile yeah. is so important for my mental health. Like I cannot be a slug. Yeah. And so getting out and that was important for me. But I think that I pushed myself. I was like raised with a mom who went back to work three months after having yeah. each five of us babies. And so there was a guilt, like a shame, guilt shame that I was doing on myself. Like I need to be back at work and it's not okay for me to take time. And I committed to these things before having the baby. And I felt like I'd be letting a lot of people down if I didn't do it. And so, and if, because I, I try to, if I say I'm going to do something, always show up and 100%. I don't want to be that person who doesn't. And so I, I think that I just, I'm glad that I did those things, mm -hmm. but I, I've learned that I also need to take some time for myself mm -hmm. and because that makes it better for everybody else, mm -hmm. you know, for me to be here today, for me at home with my family, all of that stuff. Like it's okay. Somebody told me once, what is your yes really worth if you never say no? And I'm really trying to like put that into my kind of mantra these days is like, choose the things that you're going to do mm -hmm. and be picky about them because that's where you're going to put your energy yes. and you don't have to say yes to everything no. that comes your way and so that I think is what's changed being a mom now is my time is I'm valuing my time a lot more mm -hmm. and giving less of myself to everyone yes and being specific about where I give my time yes and it's interesting you say that because I'm literally in the same path right now of focusing where I spend my time you know we travel so much for work and hunting yeah. and trade shows and trips and yeah and it's so fun and I'm so blessed yeah but I'm really trying to focus on how can I be more present at home yeah and and also still be productive and feel like I'm contributing to what I feel like my purpose is and in inspiring yeah. and educating, but also kind of slowing down a little bit and saying, okay, well, I can't be everywhere all the time, every weekend being somewhere new. I have to pull back a little bit and say, okay, well, I can do these things and I can support you in these ways, but I can't be present everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and giving that time to your marriage too, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And not just everything for work and mm -hmm. that stuff, but it's good. It's good to have those check-ins mm -hmm. and it's, there is also a time where you are meant to run mm -hmm. and be running all the time and that's great and do yeah. that. And then when it changes and you feel like you're burning at both ends, check with yourself and there, you, there's mm -hmm. a season for everything. Mm -hmm. you know and it's just kind of like realizing okay now we need to divert a little bit yeah so mm -hmm. yeah so is are you taking molly on the road with you then when you're yeah. traveling and touring for country outdoors well yeah we are um and i mean part of the blessing is that we can yes i want to raise her and i don't want somebody else to raise 100%. her and we live in a crazy world right now where i mean even the christian schools here in nashville had that crazy situation going yes. on here and so we're trying to figure out what the future looks like in terms of education and what we're going to do there um, but for the time being she's going to be on the road with us mm -hmm. and I love that and we're just kind of you know going into spring we're so heavy on turkey on the turkey tour and then you know the fall and all that but um, we've got a really good product production house now and so it's going to be Zach in the mornings me in the afternoons when we can bring help on the road with us, we will. Um, and then just kind of like really just planning out the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. I should be drawing, drawing my Iowa tag finally, five points. I should have drawn it last year, but mm -hmm. I didn't. So planning that out, having help for that so that mm -hmm. Zach can be with me for that. And Is he filming mom. for you or are you, are you hiring? No, no, so we have a product, yeah, we have a production <clears throat> um, team working under us. So Zach hosts now, but he oversees it all. Um, and we finally, finding a good producer has been a, 
It's been a lot, um, but we finally found a guy and he uh, he went to film school and mm -hmm. he's got a really good background and he's building out a team for us and he's very good at quick turnaround and all that mm -hmm. and very reliable. So we're in a good spot now, finally. We've got, it's been, a, it had been a challenge for a while. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, as you know, it's, you know, A, it's a hard, hard to get somebody to be on the road with you that long and then, you know, you always have an expectation of what you want out and if, it, yeah, it's a lot. It is. And, um, you know, like the cameraman I primarily film with, he's filmed with me since 2017. He's like my family member. I love yeah. him. Like he's here at this event this weekend. He's not working and I'm like yeah. hanging out with him. And yeah. I mean, we're super close. I love his wife. Um, and, and that takes, you know, that takes time also. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in all the years of us working together, I think we've had possibly one disagreement. Yeah. And that's it. We're just, we get along. And, and yeah. that's, you know, that relationship. Yeah, that, yeah, that relationship really really matters and it is you know it's not easy to put together yeah and also my husband does a bit of filming for me but I also want to stay married yeah, <laughs> so, yeah I know <laughs> so yeah he does not film for me full-time no, because it's I, just too gosh. strenuous on your marriage the amount of uh whispering arguments we have had mm -hmm. I, I yes smart decision yeah. It's a catch-22, though, because Zach is the best videographer that I know. Yes. And so for my, like, big game hunts, I want him to be there with me. But I also need to be able to get into the zone before going in. And so it's like he can be a little bit particular or not particular but he has his way of doing things I have my Certainly. way of doing things and yeah so I, I totally get that I yes get it. I and, get it. and we our marriage is exactly the same way I yeah. understand I get this yeah. so <laughs> it is um there's always that and so what are your big hunts this year so obviously your turkey tour yeah the turkey tour um which I'm so excited for because last year you know I didn't really hunt at all I did one one duck hunt and one turkey hunt and I found out I was pregnant literally on the first deer hunt in Oklahoma um, so it was a which is fine it was just a very chill year for me so hardcore turkey spring uh, starting in Florida we're doing a lot of youth hunts and things like that scattered in between we've got some artist camps and stuff um, happening and then um, in the fall I've got Iowa, Kansas, and an elk hunt. Mm -hmm. So it'll be mama's year, finally. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I'll be coming back with a vengeance. So what state are you elk hunting in? Uh, right now, I'm pretty sure Colorado. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah, yeah. you can draw it. Yeah. 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 So Still has that yeah, OTC. We've, got, we've been putting the points in for Wyoming. Um, last year, Zach had a really good elk hunt in Montana. So we've been working with Land Trust. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know them. Yeah. They're out of Mon Montana. Um, and we're working with them again this year. And he had he got on some really good property in Montana last year as well. So it's either going to be Colorado or Montana, mm -hmm. just depending on yeah. Well, that sounds right. fantastic. Oh, uh, and I'm doing the women's antelope hunt in Wyoming. Oh, you are yeah. doing that. I yeah. live there. That's yeah. my hometown. So do you know Ogden Driscoll? No. Okay, so he's the senator of Wyoming, but um, they've invited me out okay. there to hunt in it. And I've been wanting to do that for years. Yes. And I've always been a bit late to getting into it, and so they've invited me out there this year, and You're, I'm so excited. It's a fabulous hunt. You're, that's yes. actually why I moved to Wyoming. I oh. went there to the Wyoming women's antelope hunt. And Mark and Jenny Gordon, that's the governor and the first lady, they were there every night and at the event and the people were amazing. Yeah. And the, the landscape of Sheridan, Wyoming in the U Cross where you're gonna yeah. be at is absolutely fantastic and magical. And I literally got off the phone. It's like you were speaking about hearing the Lord speak to you. I literally saw these mountains and God told me this is home. And I had just built a beautiful custom home in Oregon, had a beautiful gun range, had my dream home, right? And I have my dream husband. And um, and I called my mom and my dad and my husband and I said, we're moving to Wyoming. And six months later, we moved there for that Wyoming Women's Antelope Camp. Wow. It was really incredible. Um, so we'll have to connect on that. Yeah. If, if we're not in the back country somewhere, yeah. then we'll have to. Definitely. Um, and I've been meaning to get back to that. I donate uh, jewelry to that event every year, but it's it's also the peak of our hunting season. So we're deer hunting, we're elk hunting, yeah. you know, so it's really hard to make yeah. that trip every year, but it is a remarkable trip. And the, oh, the people know. are fantastic and you're absolutely going to love the charm of Wyoming and in, in our cowboy state. Well, we, so we hunt out there most years and the reason I even got that connected, so, I, my, I was doing my first single season Grand Slam, um, which for anyone who doesn't know what that is, it's like uh, get, shooting every 
North species American of species turkey. of wild turkey. And so I had one left and it was my Merriam. And this was in 2017 or 18. And Wyoming people don't really give access for hunting. Mm -mm. Not especially, turkey maybe a little bit more, but it's it's not really that much of a thing. Whereas in like, you could go to Nebraska and knock on it and they don't care about turkey. Um, and so I had been, we had been going through the Black Hills. It was like 20 mile an hour winds. We were just having no success. We were hiking our tushies off every day. Every day I was driving past the Devil's Tower. And when I first drove in, I said to my brother, um, to Zach, not my brother, <laughs> my husband, um, wouldn't it be cool to shoot a turkey under the Devil's Tower? That would be so cool. And uh, we'd driven past this property every day and having no success and I see these two strutters out in the field and at the time Forrest Gump was like six That's months old. That's your little dog. Yeah, Forrest Gump, little red golden, six months old. And I said, I'm just gonna go ask for permission. What the heck? So I walk down there, there's this old cowboy in the driveway and I said, excuse me, sir. And I kind of put on the Australian a little bit and I was like, I've come all the way from Australia to shoot my single season flam and I've got one bird left to get and I can't get permission anywhere. Do you think I could shoot one of those birds in your front field? And he was like, you know what? Every day, and this is the uh, PG version of how he said <laughs> it, but he said, every day people ask me for permission to hunt on my land and every day I say no, but you know what? Go shoot that sucker. And so I went and hunted that bird. I shot that bird under the devil's tower. It was oh, an epic hunt. And I always keep in our truck something like a bottle of wine or something in case somebody gives me permission somewhere and I need to give them a gift or whatever it is. And so I bought this bottle of red wine at the Prairie Berry Winery up in South Dakota and I got the burn and I said to Zach, we've got to go give this to him to say thank you. And so I knocked on the door and he said, are you doing anything right now? And I said, no. And he said, do you want to come in and have a whiskey? And I was like, sure. It's five o'clock somewhere in the world. It was like, you know, 12 o'clock. Yeah. Oh, let's go in. <laughs> sat down with him. Well, turns out he's the senator of Wyoming. His family are the Driscolls. And so if you've ever been to Texas mm -hmm. and you know of Driscoll Hotel, mm -hmm. that's them. They brought cattle up, millions of cattle up um, in the 1800s from Texas up to Wyoming. And they settled under the Devil's Tower. They have 20,000 acres mm -hmm. there. And uh, they have this historic cabin and everything. And so he's telling me this whole story. And I was like, like, this is like out of a movie mm -hmm. and so we sat there and he loved that I was a female hunting and all of this and got to meet his wife and all of his friends and then every year we've come back and hunted in the one shot turkey shoot in Hewlett, Wyoming mm -hmm. and we've stayed friends and I said to him that first year if there's any opportunities and he told me about that antelope yeah. hunt and so every year I've been calling and then this year I was literally at SHOT Show and I got this Wyoming number and it was a new number I yeah. had it and I answered it and he said Mary, I finally got you on that antelope hunt. There you go, five years later. That's fantastic. Yeah, that yeah. is the way Wyoming is. It yeah. is a truly remarkable state. Oh, and it's the red rock beautiful. and everything out there, it's just yeah. insane. It's yeah. gorgeous. It's yeah. gonna be, you're going to love it. Well, yeah. you've been there. Yeah. Yeah, but it, you cross is, it stole my heart. When I was there, I was literally like, it changed my life, the yeah, course smells, of my life. Yeah. And and that's the fantastic thing about Wyoming as a state, It, it um, the people. Yeah. It's the people. They're amazing people. Yeah. So we're very excited to welcome you back Yay! this year for that. It'll yeah, I'll wonderful. let you know when I'm up there for sure. Yes, please. A hundred percent. Because yeah. um, if we're not packed into the back country, I have to come see you yes, for that. Yes, for and, sure. And um, yeah, maybe even tag along for your antelope hunt. But you'll have cool. a tremendous time. And, and yeah. it's very... It's wonderful fellowship and camaraderie, and it and it all goes back to also the women go hunting theme, which is where we're sitting at yeah. their booth here at SCI, and um, a lot of the women that are on that hunt are on scholarship, so they all have a lot of personal journeys from cancer survival or husbands that have passed away that you know may have been the leaders of their household, and now they find themselves as single moms, you know, being wow. the leaders yeah. of their households with spiritually hunting everything, you know, and and there's so many there's so many stories, and um, there was a woman there that spoke at the event, and and um, she said, I don't want to put this out there as pressure to all of you, but when I did this hunt, it literally changed my life. And I listened to what she said, and I didn't think anything of it. I thought, kind of to myself, 
it's a hunt, really. I mean, how can it really change my life? And it was so prophetic, her words, because that weekend literally changed the course of my life. And she spoke into that audience something <laughs> yeah. that I never thought was possible. Really and that cool. shows you the power of our Lord and, yeah. and how like your turkey hunt can really change your life and yeah. open these doors and and you coming back to Nashville over and over and not yeah. giving up on your dreams and your family thinking you're crazy yeah. and now you're married with a beautiful baby girl and yeah. you're traveling the world and um what an incredible what an incredible story you have um you too. I'm so fascinated with you and yeah. I'm so thankful we got to sit down yeah. um how do people find you on social media? They want to follow you. Um, yep. So you can Mary O'Neill Phillips on Instagram, Country Outdoors on Instagram. Same thing on YouTube, Facebook, and all that stuff. Shoot me a message. I love hearing from new people and mm -hmm. making friends. We're always on the road. We I think we did 20 states last year. We did over a million vehicle impressions. So we're probably passing through a town near you. Send me a message and say hi. Yeah, yeah and uh, you can watch her show, Country Outdoors, airs on Outdoor Channel. Yeah, Outdoar Channel Digital, Motsi Oak Go, My Outdoor TV, everywhere digitally, weekly throughout the year. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much thank for taking for the time me. and uh, joining us here. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in. I want to thank our presenting sponsor, Ruger, Safari Club International, and On X Hunt for sponsoring this podcast and helping this be brought to your homes. And also, I want to invite you guys to check out my website, PursueTheWild.com, where the podcast is streaming, my series is streaming, and also invite you to click the discount tab because I want you to find the best deals on partner gear. Go on that tab. You can save 25% on an SEI membership using code TITUS23 plus tons of other discounts. So you guys get on my website, check it out, and thank you all for tuning in. Awesome. When conditions get tough on a mountain hunt, your gear must be tougher. Making every opportunity count means selecting equipment that will not fail. Any condition, anywhere, Hornady Outfitter ammunition is designed to perform. Available in a wide range of cartridges from 243 to 375 Ruger. When you're looking for a hard hitting, deep penetrating bullet and cartridge that performs in the most rugged environments, look no further than Hornady Outfitter ammunition. Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.